So we ended on where we are talking about uh, the ABO blood group. Huh? And uh, this was a build up to the concept of uh, multiple alleles, okay? So we're just going to build up on that concept. Yeah, so for the ABO blood group is one of several different blood group systems. So I know this is the most common one that we, we know, that we are familiar with, but uh, there are other systems used to categorize um, blood groups, but the ABO blood group system, as we may know, it's something that's uh, very, very uh, common and standardized. So, however, it's a very good example of uh, multiple allelic inheritance, meaning that the genes that are coding for these things, the alleles, they are more than what? Or we can say they are three or more. Okay? So the alleles are three or more. So now that's so now that sets up a very, very interesting thing because now we know that there are going to be a number of uh, genotypes and uh, phenotypes as well. So blood group phenotypes are due to proteins bound to the surface of red blood cells which are known as antigens so perhaps you may be wondering to say how do we get to say that uh, this blood group it's a this blood group is b it's all because there are certain proteins which are bound on the surface of what of the red blood cells and these are what we call the antigens so it's more or less like uh, this partic these particular proteins, it's more or less like they give identity to these uh, um, to these red blood cells so much that depending on what kind of uh, antigen is on it, then we are going to uh, then it's designated whether it's uh, A, it's B, it's O, or A B. So those proteins which are bound to the surface of red blood cells, and then they uh they actually and as a result of them you actually have uh, those blood group phenotypes so in the abo blood group system the blood the bloods are controlled or the blood groups are controlled by one gene called the i okay so that's the capital i yeah? so just take the capital i as being the gene and now this particular gene has got three alleles Okay, so let me just go uh, on that one once again. So, the gene is I, and it's got three alleles, uh, being A, B, and O. Now, the relationship that these alleles have with one another is very, very important because it's actually what sets, uh, uh, you know, that it's, it's actually what determines what kind of blood group uh, a particular a person is going to have. So one thing you should know is that A and B, the A and B alleles, they are what? They are codominant. Okay, so again, that's why you may, that's why uh, we had to discuss the types of what? We had to discuss the type of alleles because uh, once you understand what codominant means, then you are well aware to say, uh, these are going to be the alleles where uh, both, when they appear together, both are going to be what? Both are going to be expressed. Okay, so that point alone is very, very important. Then the other relationship that we'll talk about is the relationship that is uh, between A, between allele A and, and uh, O. And we know that uh, A is what? A is dominant, is dominant to O, and B is also dominant to, uh, to O. So this means that A, the allele A is equal or is codominant to allele B, but A and B are both dominant to what? To O. Okay, so you see what uh, the consequences for that are. So now, there are three alleles but there are six possible combinations and it's these combinations that give us the different blood groups. So for blood group A, because we know that uh, uh, blood group A, there are two kinds or there are two types of genome, there are 
two kinds of genotypes that a person with blood group A is going to have. They can either be uh, hom uh, homozygous A, which is the first thing there you see. They've got AA, they are going to be blood group A. And then they can also have where they've got uh, A allele, and then they also have the O allele. Because we know that uh, A is dominant, right, over O. So meaning that even if it's A and O, we know that the A is going to be the one which will produce the phenotype, right? Because the dominant one, okay? So that's important to take note of. And then we go for B. Again, for the blood group B, it's the same thing. It can either be homozygous uh, B or it can be uh, heterozygous where you've got uh, allele B and allele O, okay? Knowing that O is recessive, okay? Then uh, blood group AB, uh, you know, we know that A and A and B are codominant. So you see, when they appear together, both are expressed. Okay. So when someone is blood group A B, automatically you know that uh, that's their genotype. Uh, there are no two ways about it. Then O, oh, someone if O is recessive, remember from what we said about a recessive allele, how can a recessive allele be? Uh, what can I say? How can a recessive allele be expressed? A recessive allele can only be expressed when it occurs in the homozygous form. Okay? So that's something that's very, very important technology. So that's why when you see someone with blood group O, you know that they have to be homozygous recessive. So, uh, so now let's do some crossings on these blood groups so for this first one uh okay i think let's let's do something uh with this let's see if we can try to cross okay we, we are going to do some crosses today so that uh, we can have a few of them but anyways so the first one is just telling us that two parents who are both blood group o uh you see, so we know their genotype. They are, you know, they are going to be homozygous because that's the only way you can have a blood group O. So all their children are going to be blood group O. That's why I'm sure you may have heard or watched movies where uh, they can determine whether uh, that's the child of someone based on the blood groups. Because you can imagine if this couple... Uh, you know, finds themselves with a child that's blood group A or B or anything other than blood group O. o. I, I, I'm guessing that you get an idea of uh, just how catastrophic the situation can be. Huh? So uh, that's what's important to take note of. Then let's now look at uh, this couple. Okay, yeah. So for the first one, all their children are going to be blood group O. Then let's now look at our lovely second couple. So this is a couple uh, between someone that has got uh, blood group AB and someone who's got blood group O. So now for this one, let's do a cross. So uh, let's write up something so that we can be able to appreciate this. So, okay. I'm going to start projecting something so that uh, we can get a good okay so what we are looking at is a couple right and this couple the they actually have uh, uh, so we've got one that is blood group a B and the one, other one, that's blood group O. So first of all, the first thing that has to come to mind is you have to separate the gametes, okay? So you have to separate the, the gametes. And then from there, you'll be able to see how they are going to relate with one another. So that's the first thing that you do. So uh, what are the gametes for this, our lovely couple? So for this one, for this parent, that has got uh, blood group A, B. So the gametes that we are going to have, uh, so we know that the genotype is going to be, okay, so we know that the genotype is going to be,
then we know that for the O, it can only be when it's homozygous recessive. Then, having done this then, we are now going to separate these into the gametes, right? So, So then, what we are then going to have is, we are going to cross these. Huh? There, we have it. Okay. Then, uh, for this other one. Okay, so let's write for this. Then for this one, it's going to be, let's make, let's make it different. Uh, anyway, let's, let's redo them. So the first one, like that. that like that like that and like that yeah that's how the crosses are supposed to be not how i put them last time so that's how you do it so then for this one it's going to be a that for this one it's going to be b then again here we are going to have what a and then o then here we are going to have b and o so you see that's the genotype right so when you then what blood groups are you going to have so for this one you're going to have blood group a for this one blood group b for this one blood group a and blood group B. So what you're basically saying is that you're having half will be A and then the other half will be what? Is going to be blood group B. So you see that for this particular couple, there is no way they can have a child that is of the blood group uh, of blood group. Maybe let's say B oh sorry, they can't have a child that is A, B. Okay, so, and then they can't have a child that is O. Okay, so that's how, uh, that's how they do those tests to check for the blood group, whether this is the parent or maybe uh, someone is just uh, trying to be forced. Huh? Thing. So, really, that's really, really pretty much about the crosses. And I just wanted us to be able to appreciate uh, these particular crosses. Okay, so then we can now, Yes. Okay, really, uh, what can I say? Really, there is really, really no distinction. But then, the Punnett square, of course, yeah, so why I would say is uh, whichever would work. But for these, I think usually, usually, uh, I think the crosses are preferred, but usually certain questions, they are going to, okay, you always write your exams as multiple choice questions. So whether you use a Punnett square or use crosses, the examiner will never know. So, yeah, so it's, it's just out of convenience, really. But I'm sure you did that lab where uh, the specifier to say use the Punnett square or use something else so or, or use the crosses so it's basically uh just convenience since all your questions are going to be multiple choice so the examiner cannot know how you found your answer but usually they will specify if they want you to use something else. but again you, you saw that from uh, those dihybrid crosses you saw that it was actually easier for the dihybrid crosses 
to use the what's this to use the um, to use the the squares than to use the crosses so sometimes it's uh looking at convenience and all those things sometimes it's what really 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 matters at the end of the day yeah so really uh that's really really about it yeah so it's usually based uh due to preference really so it's just preference otherwise that's uh, a good question uh thank you so much so uh, having done that then we can now go back to our notes so yeah so then what then we are looking at uh, is really really quite interesting because now we are looking at um okay we've done that part okay now blood transfusion right so i'm sure you may be aware that yes it's possible to do blood transfusions uh from one person to another but then it's very very important that the blood that you are transfusing this is blood that is safe okay and this is safe in the sense that first of all it shouldn't contain any uh of course viruses but again you want blood that is compatible to the person who you are giving it to and so there are a number of ways in which you can actually determine uh if the blood is compatible or not and uh, this is what people do in the labs so you see there uh the column we've got the donor then the 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 period or yeah or the row we've got the recipients right so one thing that you have to know remember we talked about uh, the red blood cells having antigens on them right so what this basically tells you is that someone that has got a blood group o means that they don't have any antigens either o or b does that make sense so someone that has got a blood group o means that means that they don't have a what meaning they don't have either a or b antigens so then what are they going to have then these are people who are going to have anti a and anti and anti b antibody so what this basically means is if my blood group is o i don't have antigens a or b so then it meaning that my body is going to produce antibodies against the a and b antigen so much that any time when i'm given blood which contains either a or b antigen my antibodies are going to destroy that blood or rather they are going to cause a reaction okay and that's going to cause a transfusion failure then when then if your blood is uh is a this means that you you meaning this means that your red blood cells have got the a antigen on them and so you're going to have the anti b antibody meaning you can't have the a antigen and you have the anti a antibody then you kill yourself right so when you've got the a antigen someone with a, who's got a blood group a it means that they're going to have an anti b antibody that makes sense right then the same thing for someone that has got uh, an anti sorry for someone that has got blood group b it means that they've got the b antigen so mean that their red blood cells have got the what have got the b antigen on them so meaning these people cannot have the anti b antigen because oh, sorry they can't have the anti b antibody because they will kill themselves so these people are going to have the anti a antibody then we now go to the blood group a b so blood group a b has got both antigens meaning it's got antigen a and antigen b so meaning it doesn't have any antibodies because if it has an anti a it will kill itself because it's got uh a part of it which is what it, it's got a part of it which is uh it, it's got a part of it which is uh which has got the antigen a and if it has got an anti b antibody it's got a part of it which has got uh antigen b so you see uh blood group a b does not have any antibodies so what are the consequences so it means that for these for the gl blood group 
a b it can accept any blood that you give it because it doesn't have antibodies to destroy that blood okay so that's why as we we'll see later on the blood group a b is what we call universal recipient so meaning someone from someone whose blood group a b can get blood from any person because they don't have antibodies against antigen A and antigen B. So that's an important point to take note of. Then we now look at uh, blood group O. So you see, blood group O, mm, for this one, it's it's called the universal donor. And you may be wondering to say, why is it the universal donor when it's got anti it, when it's got uh, both antibodies? So how this works is even though it has got antibodies against the blood or, or, or rather even if the the blood group uh, o has got antibodies the anti a and the anti b it can't do much damage to the to the person that is receiving the blood because the antibodies are few as compared to the total amount of blood of the person receiving the blood I hope that makes sense, right? So that's why the uh, blood group O, it's called a universal donor. How I used to remember is just look at, because so, sometimes it's, it can be easy to mix them up, which is the universal recipient, which is the universal donor. So look at blood group O, it's O, right? And then look at the word donor. It's got two O's, it's got two letter O's, and recipient doesn't have any letter O. So that's how blood group O is the what is a universal donor. Then of course leaves uh, A B to be universal recipient. So that, that's how you can remember them. Huh? So what this diagram pretty much shows us is where you are seeing those two positive signs. It means that there's agglutination. So what basically agglutination simply means is when you get blood, you mix. Let's say let's look at. Uh, I, I, I hope you can see where my 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 mouse is so when when you look at here it's saying when you mix blood right let's say you get uh, blood group o and blood group o you see that negative sign it means there is no agglutination meaning that the uh, the antigen and the antibodies they are not going to react okay with one another and where you are seeing those to my plus plus then you know that there is agglutination and if there is agglutination, then you can't give, uh, then those two kinds of blood groups can't exchange blood. And then you see that for the blood group AB, for the recipient uh, uh, column, you see that they are all negative. So that's why AB is the universal recipient. Where you see for the donor, blood group O has got to my negatives throughout. So meaning it can give blood to all these other blood groups but you see for blood group uh, a b and all those things you see where there is a negative there it means that you just let's say for the second column right you see blood group a meaning when you put blood group a and blood group a you see that the cosine there is negative right but when you get blood group a and then you, you follow there on top with B, you see that there is like a sign, right? Meaning there's agglutination, meaning that blood is not compatible. So that's an important point to take note of. Yeah, so we've explained all these things. So yeah, so basically that's really, really about uh, these things. Now, we've talked about this. Uh, the other thing which is important to take note of in blood transfusion, is what you call the rhesus factor okay so now the research factor is very very important because it tends to have uh, very very huge consequences especially for 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 babies huh? for babies and so uh the blood group system uh the racers uh so involves the presence or absence of antigens called the racers factor so people that have got and then remember the antigen this is this is just a protein that's found on the red blood cells huh? so People with the racist antigen are said to be racist positive, okay, or RH positive. And then those that uh, whose red blood cells don't have this uh, this racist gene, 
oh sorry this racist antigen sorry yeah that don't have this racist uh factor this racist antigen are called i, I said to be racist negative so now this gene uh so the gene for the racist factor has got two alleles so there is one you can see there the rh positive for the racist positive and then for the rh negative right and then one thing that is important is that the rh positive it's dominant okay it's completely dominant so the fact that is it's completely dominant means that someone that is heterozygous the someone that has got rh positive and rh negative is going to have what it's going to be rh positive okay so their phenotype is going to be what is going to be rh positive then inheritance of the rh gene follows the typical mendelian partner for the single gene as shown in the table so what this basically means is because this gene has got two alleles it's pretty much the same like the crosses that we are doing right so i'm sure you can remember from the crosses that we are doing that if you were to do these crosses you get those ratios okay which are the same mendelian it's just the same as the what it's the same as uh, the monohybrid crosses huh? so you can try those with the panet square or you can try them with crosses and you're going to get those ratios huh? so that's an important point to take note of so now um, uh, it's very important that when blood is being transfused uh the racist factor is taken into consideration because like i said earlier on that it can have very huge consequences especially for the baby uh if maybe the mother is pregnant but even just overall anyway so here's what happens if somebody is racist negative and then they receive one blood transfusion from a racist positive donor so now this could be the blood groups have matched but then the recipient uh is racist negative and then the the donor is racist positive now if the person receives one blood transfusion they are not going to be harmed the reason why they are not going to be harmed is this person doesn't have antibodies against the racist factor the only way that someone can be harmed when the, the reason why if someone is give if someone is blood group a and they are given blood group b the reason why they are going to be affected it's because the uh it's, it's because the blood that's being mis mixed uh you know they are antibodies already right but for this particular person uh even though the recipient is given uh racist positive blood the first tra transfusion is not going to to cause harm but what's going to happen is that it's going to cause their white blood cells to produce antibodies against the racist factor catch this it's like when you get covid right you you're going to form antibodies against the coronavirus so meaning your chances of getting it again are are lower right so here it's the same thing when the racist fact when someone is racist negative and they receive blood from a racist positive donor the first time they are not going to be harmed but their white blood cells are going to produce antibodies against the racist positive factor okay because they've just been exposed to the racist positive for the first time so like okay wait this is a foreign body we are not used to this so they will produce antibodies okay and this process is called sensitization okay so now when the person is now given blood for the second time what's going to happen is now you uh, the antibodies are now already there they were formed from the what from the first transfusion so this is going to cause the antibodies to agglutinate so the agglutination is just the binding that we talked about right so the antibodies are going are going to agglutinate the racist positive blood and that can have uh, consequences right but um a person that is racist so that's about if the uh, if the recipient is racist negative but someone that is racist positive they can receive blood from someone that is racist negative as many times as they want without any harm because the racist negative blood 
you know doesn't have the racist factor and this particular individual that is racist positive they are racist positive and the blood is is, is racist negative so there is no reaction that happens there so let's talk let's take note of that so now there is this disease called erythroblastosis fetalis so again it's the same thing let's take for instance if uh, a woman a mother or no, no let's say a pregnant woman so if a pregnant woman that is racist negative carries a fetus uh that has got uh a racist positive allele now remember that uh, the racist positive allele is dominant right so meaning even someone that is heterozygous for the racist factor is going to be racist positive so then what this basically means now is that uh yeah so what this basically means is that when the pregnant woman carries the child that is racist positive what's then going to happen is that uh, there's a possibility that blood can leak across the placenta from the fetus okay so there's a possibility that blood can pass from the fetus to the mother's circulation isn't it because you know the placenta there is some you know the the blood vessels there but there's a possibility that just a tiny amount of blood you know can be able to leak or sometimes it can happen even during birth okay uh the blood of the fetus may mix with the blood of the mother so again what happens there is that when that happens again the mother is going to be sensitized meaning now she's going to form antibodies against the one against the racist factor so now when she forms those uh racist uh those racist antibodies the the antibodies against the racist factor but she's already delivered we are assuming right so meaning the first child will survive but when she has a second child that is a uh, racist positive the antibodies are there so what these antibodies are going to do is that they are going to attack the red blood cells of the fetus breaking them down and causing an abortion so when you come to the ward when you go to women and newborn hospital when someone comes to you and they've had maybe a uh, spontaneous abortion meaning that they they the abortion has happened without any external factors then you, you would want to test the whether they are racist negative and to test the husband okay because it could just be that it's uh, erythroblastosis fetus. so that's how you think it should be when you come to the to the words huh? anyway so then <clears throat> So this problem can also arise if a racist negative mother carrying a racist fe uh, fe positive fetus received <clears throat> racist positive blood during transfusion. So now you, you can imagine that here is a woman, uh, maybe she has sickle cell or she's got or she was involved in an accident and uh, she needed blood unknowingly. She was given racist positive blood and uh you know because she was just sensitized she she she, she just formed uh antibodies against the racist positive factor so you can find then when she has her first child if the if the fetus that she has is racist positive remember she's already been sensitized from the what from the blood transfusion so you can find that someone just the first pregnancy abortion the second one abortion and uh People may be wondering why, but it could just be uh, because of the erythroblastosis fetalis. Huh? So that's why when uh, they are, when we are going to get blood from the blood bank, it has to be cross-checked by the doctor. So that should anything, if it's wrong blood, then the doctor, if he didn't check properly because he was rushing, then you have to, to be answerable. Anyway, another example of uh, multiple allelic gene is that which controls coat color in rabbits so uh the gene is given by the symbol c and it exists in four different allelic forms yes okay so you mean that uh okay so mean that there is okay so usually the okay 
So the thing is, if the mother is racist negative and the father is racist positive, I really the advice that you would give them really it's uh maybe let's say that there is the first one where you'd be like okay when you have once you know that you are pregnant ensure that you uh that you that you are really taking care of the pregnancy in the sense that you ensure that once you get pregnant go and ensure that you check the racist factor of the child okay and then there is also some medication that they give okay uh to the to these women so that uh they they, they call it, is it the anti d yeah it should be anti d so they are going to give them those antibodies so that the antibodies that they will be given uh they will just work for a short time but since the antibodies have already been given through the anti d it then means that when uh, it means that the body won't form antibodies against the child because the body will think oh we already have the we already have the antibodies but that's just a medication and after some time the, the medication will run out of the body but the body will be will, will be tricked into thinking as though it produced antibodies right or or even better because that those, those antibodies are going to mask that you can find that there will be no sensitization that's going to happen so that's why uh it's very very important usually the advice is before getting married seek certain genetic counseling but uh I, 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 unfortunately most people shy uh shun uh these genetic counseling but uh they're very very important because someone can just be having abortions and uh, some marriages can even break down because someone simply is having uh abortions and they think maybe it's uh something from the family but it's simply uh erythroblastosis fetalis so yeah that's a good question but yeah you definitely learn about this more uh in women and newborn hospital it's very very interesting yeah but thank you so much for the question so uh okay so for yeah so the, the another example of the multiple allelic gene is uh, the one that controls coat color in rabbits and the gene is given a symbol c and exists in four different allelic forms so in short it just has four different alleles huh? So there is the C right there, that's a goatee. So that's a particular coat color, right? Then there is the other one, that's C, and then the like CH there on top, that's a chinchilla or kinkilla, anyway, which, uh, whichever. Then you've got that C with like a H there, that's Himalayan. And then you've got the C, that should be lowercase C, that's albino. So this means that for the coat color that the rabbit is going to have, these alleles are going to be interacting and so depending on the kinds of alleles that that particular rabbit is going to have that's going to determine the color and that's why you see that rabbits can have so many colors huh? so you find that like this one has got this color this one has got this color anyway but uh, where the money really is is the dominance relationship between the four alleles so you see that the agoti is the most dominant huh? Uh, it's more dominant than the kinkila and then the kinkila is more dominant than the himalayan and of course the albino is uh is uh the most recessive okay relative to the others so then what happens that if you have these kinds of uh genotypes and phenotypes these are the kind also if you've got let's say let, let's look at the first one if you've got uh, the CC, that's for agoti, agoti. Then you've got the agoti and the kinkila. You've got the agoti and the Himalayan. You've got the agoti alleo and the albino alleo. You see that the phenotype is going to be what? It's going to be agoti because we, we looked at that, uh, uh, how the how the dominances are occur or rather uh, how are arranged how they are arranged isn't it so then what's their goatee phenotype so their goatee phenotype it's where the rabbit is going to appear uh the full color to the coat of the uh, of the wild rabbit is going to be grayish brown okay so grayish brown color that's a goatee then now when you now have the the 
chinchilla and chinchilla so you see those ones they should the first two they shouldn't be a comma that should be one thing huh? you, the second one and you, you can see you know the way where my mouse is or my uh, my pointer is they shouldn't be a comma it should be chinchilla and chinchilla okay so since the chinchilla are homozygous so this is going to have a chinchilla phenotype then the other one you've got chinchilla and uh, himalayan you know that chinchilla is is is, is more dominant over the himalayan then you see the chinchilla with the albino you are going to get the chinchilla phenotype so really that's pretty much about it right it's just just about appreciating uh these things okay then for this other one uh there is an error the the third one it should be ch and ch it shouldn't be chinchilla there because if it's chinchilla then since chinchilla is uh more dominant over himalayan then this is going to be uh chinchilla but so the one that was writing these notes made a mistake it's supposed to be ch ch not cch there right because that would be chinchilla and chinchilla is more is dominant is more dominant over himalayan so meaning that this thing would be himal which would be king killer which is not what we are looking at so it should be ch ch there okay okay then when we've got ch which is the the himalayan and the albino uh the rabbit is going to be himalayan is going to have himalayan uh is going to have himalayan phenotype okay so that's something important to take note of mm, where else now we now talk about albino so for the albino since the albino is the most recessive what it means that it can the rabbit can only be an albino if it's only the albino alleles which are present, wow. right? So if there is Himalayan, it means that the Himalayan is what's going to be seen. If there is a king killer, it means the king killer is the one that's going to be seen. If there is the god, the god is the one that's going to be seen. So therefore, the uh, the rabbit can only be an albino if uh, it's a homozygous recessive for the albino. So meaning lowercase c, lowercase c there. So the albino phenotype is just going to be a carabit that's white. It's white, a, a, a white rabbit. Huh? Uh, okay. So that's and the eyes have got no pigment. Huh? Like uh, yeah, like the way uh, yeah, cause they are albinos. So that about it. So now let's now talk about variation. So variation is the difference in characteristics shown by organisms belonging to the same population or species. So how best you can think of it is look at human beings. We are all the same species, but we don't look alike. Okay. So we are all human beings, but we don't look alike. You may have maybe the same eyes or the same height with, with your sibling, but you don't look alike unless you are identical. Okay. Unless you are identical twins but uh you can be from the same parents but you'll be different to begin with some will be males and others will be will be females isn't it so there again you you see just the difference but you are from the same parents but you've got different genders so <clears throat> that's the best uh how we can understand variation then there are two types of uh, phenotypic variation there is continuous and discontinuous so we are going to start with the discontinuous. What's the discontinuous kind of variation? So, like the like the word discontinuous entails, it simply means it's either this or not. Okay, so it's that thing where you are. Uh, examples could include gender in animals and plants, right? So you are either male or female. There is nothing like. There is nothing like this person is so there is nothing like this person is 2.5 female and this person is 1.5 male there is nothing like that right and when you are doing the census you won't say ah, there is this one who's uh, you know you just say okay we looked at uh, or let's, let's just say for families who say there are two boys and there are three girls you don't say ah there are 2.5 girls and there are two point you know so it's either that or that, okay? 
Then there's eye color. You know, it's either have green eyes, yellow eye, or no, blue eyes, black eyes, brown eyes, things like that. Then the other thing is blood groups. You are either blood group A or B or O or A, B. You can't say my blood group is somewhere around 2 point something. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah. So the other thing is the body color in the mouth are based on betularia. Uh, where they can have the melanic or light forms anyways so the key point here is that discontinuous it's they show clear-cut differences between the different phenotypes so meaning that the individuals which are varying uh in a discontinuous manner they are showing clear-cut differences between uh the different phenotypes so that's something that's important to take note of then you have uh, the yeah so then the other thing which is important about discontinuous variation is that they are usually controlled by one or two major genes which have two or more allelic forms and their phenotypes are relatively unaffected by the environment so let me just break that down. so what that simply means is that these particular discontinuous variation they are usually uh, controlled by a small number of genes okay it can just just be one or two and with maybe two or more alleles okay are uh, involved and you see where uh, the difference comes in with continuous variation so for these ones they're going to have a small number of genes involved uh, and then they are going to have either two or more allelic forms and their phenotypes are relatively unaffected by the environment so you can't say I'm female because I was born in Zambia. You wouldn't say that now, right? So whether you were born in America, if 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 the if if the zygote was female, irrespective of where uh you know you would be born from, you would still be female. So really the environment really doesn't affect much on the discontinuous variation huh? so you don't say ah, had, had, had i been born in the us my blood group would have been O. no there's nothing like that so because you can't quantify uh discontinuous variation it's called qualitative it's also called qualitative variation and they love these questions in your mcqs okay what's there what uh is just a discontinuous variation is also called qualitative variation why is it called qualitative you, you remember from what we've, we've been doing in chemistry so far we said it's only uh the what did we say yeah so we said that uh, those graphs that we are looking at were for the continuous variations right standard deviation height you know things like that right and those we could quantify them but you can't quantify gender can you to say no this person is 2.5 female is you know you can't do that right so it's qualitative just saying it is enough just saying someone is female then everyone will know that this is female like you don't have to give a quantity of how much someone is female so that's the point there then continuous variation so this is like i said this uh, like i said for discontinuous i said discontinuous is by what by a, a, a few number of genes right but for continuous variation it's, it's it's one in which a character is controlled by many genes which are working together so take note many genes are, are involved in continuous variation and then the characters or meaning the traits they are going to show a range of values so much that you are going to have a mean value let's talk for instance about height there is a mean height for for almost every age okay and that's why you see that when someone is five years old and people say ish tell you or this child is tall for 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 the age you know because there is that mean mean height for a particular age isn't it and that's why you say mm, that person is is a dwarf because by that age they are not supposed to have that particular height so that's really really the key thing so uh, for continuous variation you are going to have a mean okay a mean so you find that for for most adults there is a certain height that they should have then we are going to say okay yes that's a normal adult or you say mm, that's a very tall adult or that's a short adult right so 
that's a key thing then the other thing about such characters about by characters i mean these traits of continuous variation is that they are produced by combined by combined effects of many genes polygenes and the environment okay and like i was talking about the frequency distribution you, you may remember that those are the thing these are the things that we've been looking at in chemistry you see those my graphs huh? so let's say how does uh, the environment come in okay so we are, we are looking at that graph that's looking at height huh? so you see that like i was saying there's a mean height that every adult is supposed to have or any person at a particular um let's say age is going to have right and so when you check the height for people you are going to find that there's one height which is going to be the mean okay where the majority of people have then they are going to be extremes those who are very tall and those who are very short but the mean is going to be there and that's where the majority of people are going to lie so because these continuous variations these uh, uh continuous characters or traits you can quantify them okay you you, you you've seen that that table there you can calculate the mean you can calculate the standard deviation so these can be quantified therefore they are quantitative characters or continuously varying traits okay so examples you've got uh, height which we've talked about and then we've also talked about body weight okay people have got varying weights so that's the key thing but again the thing which is important about the continuous variation is that they are very much affected by the environment let's take this for instance an individual may have the genotype to be a very tall person but maybe they grew up, they were malnourished, they grew up, they never used to have three meals a day, you know, and all this. So they will be stunted. In short, they will be, even though they've got the genotype to be tall, but they won't be tall. Or they may not be as tall as their genotype can permit them to be because the environment has affected them. But there's no way you can say I'm female because because i never used to eat good meals no you can't say that right so that's why gender is what is discontinuous but for things like weight height they are what they are continuous and they tend to be affected a great deal by the environment in plants yield is a polygenic trait so yield is how much you get from what you've planted so again it's going to be affected by many genes such as those responsible for germination uh, for the rate of photosynthesis for amount of root and also how resistant uh the plants are to drought we know that there are certain plants which are able to grow in 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 uh, hot areas in places where there is few water supply and they're able to grow so it's because of those things so you will find that maybe someone may have a small yield the other one may have a medium yield other one will have a very bumper harvest and that's usually going to be affected by what by the environment to a great deal and you can see if there that there are, the number of genes involved are a lot for germination for photosynthesis for the amount of root for drought tolerance and etc etc right so that of course just shows that for for uh continuous variation it's going to be a number of uh factors or genes rather that are going to be involved so tomorrow we'll continue with this mm, yeah we'll continue to look at the differences between qualitative uh yeah this will be a summary of, of what we've discussed and then we can continue so we are on remaining of about 11 pages anyway so are there any questions